Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Science q and I, by the way, have some very loud pigeons that have been on my roof since 6am. So should you hear any kind of strange, almost horror story, a uh, little bit similar to Tony Scott's The Hunger kind of clattering uh, or a John Woo film, that's just my roof. Uh, anyway, today we are going to be talking uh, about natural selection and evolution and skulls, undoubtedly skulls and uh, human skulls, hominid skulls. Uh, I never know on the show and tell there's bound to be at the very least, I would have thought, uh, one skull. Uh, we're joined by uh, Rebecca Rag Sykes and, uh, and Chris Stringer. And uh, I'll just tell you a couple of things we we'll get started, which is our latest tips for existences with A.L. Kennedy, who is a brilliant writer and activist and sometimes comedian as well, and uh, and wrote the only book that has uh, actually made me, I, I think, cry. It- in, when I was sitting in a cafe in in Swansea reading her beautiful book, uh, The Little Snake. So she's on the latest Tips for Existence. Uh, next week's Tips for Existence is uh, David Baddiel. And uh, also we've got uh, the current book shambles is Michael Spicer, who I'm sure you've seen his internet stuff, uh, the, that brilliant Room Next Door thing. And uh, also I'd really recommend if you get a chance, listen to the interview we did very recently with Jesse Cave, uh, whose, whose recent book is, is a really uh, beautiful piece of work. It's, uh, it's a novel but it has uh its kind of roots in 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 her own life and it is brilliant and uh next week we're gonna do a family show uh family uh it says here on the thing talking about science education that does not sound hey kids guess what we're gonna talk about science education we'll actually make sure that alam shah tries to blow something up or, or, or something anyway with huge health and safety risk that we couldn't do in the theater but which we'll make alam do in his own home we will do something like that so uh next week we are going to do a family show lots of different ideas about science education what we should be doing and uh, and also hopefully some fun experiments as well um now helen uh how are you uh, i'm doing very well i had an actual day off this week i went fruit picking and i made lots of jam so i've had uh, a, a good time not sitting in front of my laptop for at least some of the week um yeah, you say you man though i mean people have watched this before and they know you've done various different experiments with fruit some uh more successful than others did you just make jam was this part of is, is, is there a control jam that was involved or was this just jam um, so this is part of my non-scientific life. So I was, I have to confess, I did not have a control experiment. I did vary the jam recipe uh, ever so slightly, but I did not have a control jam next to it because I don't have enough massive pots and pans and things to do it. And also anyone who's made jam knows that you have to kind of watch it and watching two pots at once is going to get you into trouble. But yeah, no, it was, it was very good. And I haven't uh, picked, I picked all the fruit myself and it's just, it was a nice day out in the sunshine. And I think all of us need some of those these days, obviously in the outdoors, miles away from anyone, all very safe. Not me. I'm back in isolation again. Yes. Yeah, since last I'll send, weekend. I'll post you some Second jam. isolation in under <laughs> two weeks and I'm perfectly fit and well. I've done all this and I'm fine, but there we are. That's, that is the, is the way of things. I'd highly recommend to people, by the way, if you like making jam, look up George Orwell's recipe for marmalade. Uh, I've had George Orwell's uh, marmalade. I mean, not not made by George Orwell. That would definitely be off by now. But uh, the, the recipe for George Orwell's marmalade is fantastic. Now, uh, are we going to have a, a show and tell of some jam or are you going to give us a day in science um, history i've got a day in science i've got i've got a little on the topic of food that that maybe would be expected to go off i want to show you something else very quickly which is um so it has it's often said it was said by the guy who wrote the omnivores dilemma that one of the things that told you it was definitely food was that it would go off after a while uh because otherwise it might not be actual proper food and um i was very lucky this week i was given i was sent a gift by one of the young british artists gavin turk he'd seen something that i had done about rich tea biscuits and he posted me a piece of his art from 2006 he signed it at the bottom you might just be able to read that um and and so this is this is my first proper piece of art that i own but the point about it is that's a 15 year old biscuit and it hasn't gone off yet so i think that brings into question whether rich tea biscuits are really food anyway so um my this week in science uh, 1948 and it's a paper that was written in the bell systems technical journal because back then uh, bell laboratories were at the forefront of all kinds of interesting technological things and it's a paper by a guy called cloud shannon 
um, that most people haven't heard of, but they will have used, everyone will have used the consequences of this. And the paper was called The Mathematical Theory of Communication, which sounds very dry. But what he was looking at was the statistics in language and how you can, um, what if you have one letter in a sentence, what the probability of the next letter is and how that allows you to build structures of language. And he was the first, per and obviously this was just after the Second World War, so there'd been lots of cryptography and solving codes. So people were thinking about all this, all this kind of thing. Um, but what he spotted using uh, this careful probabilities in language was he spotted that you could construct sentences that looked like English that weren't, but were statistically similar. And I'm, I've written out one of his, can you read this the right way around? Um, this yeah. is one of the sentences from his paper that is, it's not English, it is entirely constructed from the statistics of the English language. Um, and you can see that although it's got some English words in it, of and the, um, it looks, you know, if you had to guess, you might identify that as a type of English you hadn't come across or ancient English or, you know. It's Chaucerish. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it's similar-ish. But the reason that this is useful is that once you've got those statistics, you can do things that we take for granted now, like lossless compression, which means that instead of sending a message with every single character, um, you know, encoded and in place, actually you can leave some of that information out and you know it must have been there because in the English language, it only ever turns up in that other structure. So when we talk about lossless compression or lossy compression, so for example, when you take a big music file and you shrink it down, so it's a much smaller file, but it still sounds like music, that's because you can reconstruct it because of the statistics of what was there originally. And the clever bit is in knowing which bits are genuinely new pieces of information, like this has to be a why, and it's a new idea that it's a why in the sentence. And which thing is that, you know, the last three letters were these, the only letter that can come next is a Y, and therefore you don't actually need to include it because it must have been there. And so when it comes to the internet and how data is sent on mobile phone networks and compressing photos, all of that comes from this th the information theory, which is what started in 1948 when Shannon wrote this paper. So he was the first person to really link up statistics of language, and that allowed all these things that he could never have dreamed of to do with reducing the amount of data you actually have to send in order to get a fuller message across. So that was in 1948. And that's this week's that's this week's week in science. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Rebecca Rags of uh, Kindred. You may well have heard the uh, science shambles we did on that or that some of the other events we've done, we've done as well. As well. Uh, it's been hugely successful. Uh, good morning, Rebecca. Hello. <laughs> What's your show and tell? We are expecting a skull. You know that. <laughs> OK, well, I'm really excited about this because I, although, <clears throat> you know, I'm like Neanderthal person, um, I actually am more of a stone tools person in terms of what I'm trained in and stuff. But I have just purchased some skull cards and it's been very exciting. So um, I will pick up mine and I'm sure within two seconds, Chris will be able to name exactly who this is. Uh, yeah, it was like La Chabelle Chabelle. From Indeed. <laughs> yeah. That's the weird thing about, about Neanderthals. I'm sure Chris finds this that they totally do become individuals and Chris has studied them you know in person as well um but yeah but I like this that, that means that more people probably recognize the skull than ever recognize the human that is a very interesting point yes um, yeah. indeed yeah. and also um the something else that I realized recently was that you know there's probably more um Neanderthal bones in places that they never actually visited <laughs> And in terms of geographical range of things, you know, like there's some in America and stuff like that. Um, you know, they never actually got over there, of course. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so I like this because, um, uh, well, it's a very interesting um, individual. It was found in 1908 and it was one of the first excavations where there was basically like a relatively complete body found and it wasn't sort of all um, messed up and mangled across the site. And it was really important in the history of science because um, it was one of the the first that were really interpreted as an intentional burial and it has remained the focus of analysis and there's been very recent analysis um, done not on the bones necessarily um, although they were part of it but actually going back to the site where this was found in France in a cave and using modern um, methods and actually re-excavating all the trash that was left in the cave to try and find the claimed pit that this individual was in and then reassess that using what we know about how sites form now and the complexities and the 
intricacies of how we can actually untangle site formation to tell us, is it really a pit? Is it not a pit? Did the body go in before this layer or after this layer? And that's something that basically archaeologists had very little um, awareness of when this was first excavated. Um, and it was actually, I think, three priests, wasn't it, who excavated this, Chris? Um, and yeah. so, you know, this was in the days when what an archaeologist was, was itself becoming a thing. You know, there wasn't really truly professional archaeologists that early. There were people who dabbled. Um, so this is an interesting individual for that history. But also, I'm just really excited to finally have a cast. Um, and it's beautiful. It's really nicely done. Um, I'm quite impressed with it. So, yeah, that's my show and tell. Today. And just remind us, in case you didn't tell us, how long ago did that individual live? Um, the La Chapelle soy individual, I think, is quite late. Um, overall, Neanderthals um, sort of emerge in anatomical terms somewhere between about 400 and 350,000 years ago. Um, we know that sort of their proto neanderthal ish um population is there about 430,000 years ago whereas this individual is pretty late um close to when they seem to have disappeared in all senses except genetic by about 40,000 years ago so that's actually a massive span of time um yeah so that's my one <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's, that's wonderful. And we're also joined, as, as you've heard already, Professor Chris Stringer, research leader in human evolution at the Natural History Museum and author of many fine books as well. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Hello there. Yeah. Thank you also for battling with technology, uh, by the way, Chris has had, uh, no, this normally happens, since, since we've moved to Sunday morning, technology we found out had, didn't actually wake up till 3pm. That's why we used to do this in the afternoon. Chris, what is your show and tell today? Well, uh, maybe no surprise to uh, some of you, but I've got this uh, green object here, um, which has been called, um, you know, Watermelon Man, um, the big green giant, uh, the Hulk. Uh, yeah, this is a replica uh, in a lovely, tasteful green colour of, of this Dragon Man skull, so-called from China, uh, that uh, was published in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah, it's made a big splash in the media. Um, and it's obviously a fantastically preserved fossil. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that a bit later. Can you just can you just put it up next to your head just so we get a real sense of the scale of it? Yeah, because this okay. is well, due to technology, ridiculous, this is on the tiny screen of my mobile phone. So I'm hoping that that's next to my head. It yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Your head. Is that it, it looks like it's maybe one and a half times as wide. Is that it, about it right? It's very wide. Yeah. In particular, its breadth is phenomenal. It's also very long. So it is. It's the biggest um, fossil human skull I've, I've ever worked with. It's, it, it is enormous. Uh, the brain size in that skull is, is large. It's uh, well up with the high values of us and Neanderthals. So a big brain and a very big head, huge jaw, great big molar tooth in there. So a very big sized head and we assume a big sized body to go with that. And what, what would have been, until this point, what have kind of been the largest specimens of, of uh, skulls of our ancestors? What, what, what would be, the, be something that possessed something? Well, Neanderthal, some Neanderthal fossils are very large. Um, so in particular dimensions, you can find an individual skull that is bigger than this in one dimension or another. So there's another skull from China, from Zhuchang, which is even bigger and which has the biggest brain size of any known fossil human. So that's a great big Chinese fossil that's about a hundred thousand years old um so yeah that skull actually matches or exceeds this one in some dimensions but this one out i can show you i've got a replica here so again on my tiny phone screen i don't know how well this is going to be anyone who breaks into your house this, is going to run so away there, there we've got either side of me so it, this one is the broken hill fossil which is a very large skull that i put into homo heidelbergensis and that is enormous but Harbin is even bigger than it. I don't know whether you can see that on your on the screen there. That looks like the saddest photo ever of the three stooges as, as they, they are, are now. now. It's, it's, uh, uh, but it's magnificent. It's, 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 it's like a Ventac. 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 But that is... Uh, yeah, well, we're well, going to we talk, talk a lot about, about this. this we've had a lot of questions uh, uh, about this. this. Really 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 I want to ask Rebecca one more thing, by the way. Just because something you tweeted this morning was interesting, which was about your 
problems with the fact that we we use a lot of what we consider to be uh, contemporary uh, continental boundaries as delineation for this is a kind of you know European human ancestor, this is an Asian human ancestor, this is. And I was just interested in terms of you were saying that you do find this very problematic to bring in these uh, more modern world delineations when talking about fossil samples. Uh, yeah, I mean that was that was in response basically to, to um, a to sort of just discussion about how we classify and how we tend to um, pigeonhole things, and it kind of links to this new skull and Harbin and the perennial eternal debate of we find a new thing, it looks weird, is it a new species? And you know, a lot of people um, are of the opinion that we should wait before we assign new species because it complicates things um, and the ways in which we can assign new species are now much more varied you know we can look at for this skull um, the the morphology the metrics you know you can put all the measurements in and compare it to something else or if you have DNA then you can throw that into the mix so what we can do in terms of classifying uh, fossil hominins in, for their bodies is one debate but also there's a debate in terms of how we classify them um, ecologically and um, in terms of the regions within which they lived. So for Neanderthals, um, historically, um, they were understood um, as a European species. I mean, the first find, first recognised find, I should say, was in Germany. The next one that was recognised, although it had been found before, was from Gibraltar, so like the other side of Europe. And immediately in the 19th century, people began to understand this was widespread. Um, but even though there were finds um, from the Near East, you know, from uh, what was then Palestine um, in the 1930s, so the Neanderthals range then extended to the Near East a little bit, they were still often conceptualised as a European species. Um, and primarily adapted to colder climates and things like this. But it's not just in science. I think that idea that Neanderthals are ancient Europeans totally stuck in the public mind. And it is it is true. There are many more sites, I would think, in Europe in terms of the numbers of sites than elsewhere for Neanderthals. Um, but that's probably partly to do with um, geology and the availability of um, the kind of stone where you get caves, basically, because those are natural um, archives which save material for us. We know Neanderthals lived across open landscapes too, but that that record tends to get sort of eroded away and it's less common. So, and also Europe has the, the longer history of research and analysis. It was better funded. There were loads of rich Victorians basically doing their thing. So the idea that Neanderthals were European is there for good reasons, but it's not accurate in terms of the geographic spread of where we know Neanderthals were. So Neanderthals in Wales, where I am, across Europe, as I said, down into the Near East, Palestine, all around the Near East, but also into Iran, into Central Asia, right across into Siberia. And although there aren't that many sites there that's probably just because we haven't found the real extent so in the sense of should we even call neanderthals eurasians well actually if you look at purely the the, the amount of space covered by that range that we know of and that's only the extent we know of you might as well call them you know asiopeans <laughs> because it's it's sort of the other way around and i think that's what's really really exciting actually about modern or, or where we are in human origins research, we are really beginning to think of hominin populations across the Eurasian continent on a continental scale. You know, what is going on? Where do we find them? How does that affect what we think about their um, their flexibility in terms of the sorts of environments they can adapt to, who they were meeting, other hominins, and what were the real boundaries? We do not know how far east Neanderthals actually got. We just don't know it yet. Um, you know, the, the far the furthest east they can get is is the coast of you know the east coast of China basically. Um, and you know, we're assuming they didn't um, get to uh, North America, but so far, I think it's much more accurate to sort of get rid of this idea that Neanderthals were definitely Europeans because don't think that is an accurate representation of of where they really were.
Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Chris, first question for you. And by the way, if you have questions, in particular in the second half, we're going to talk a lot more uh, ab about uh, Dragon Man. And uh, so if you want to send in questions, you can either tweet us at Cosmic Shambles uh, or you can pop them in the chat and Trent will make sure that uh, I get them and uh, and we will talk about those in the second half. So any questions about uh, this remarkable find, uh, then uh, pop them in and we'll deal with them in the second half. Um, but this, this question, I suppose, in some ways is related to what Rebecca was just talking about, uh, Chris. This is from Barney who says, I don't know if this is true or not, but why don't those of African descent have traces of Neanderthal DNA? Was there no interbreeding outside of Europe? Yes, yeah, so uh, it's it's certainly true that, that most Neanderthal DNA that we find in modern genomes is outside of Africa. But people in Africa do have um, variable amounts of Neanderthal DNA. So particularly people in North Africa today, they do have um, higher levels on average of, of Neanderthal DNA. Because, of course, there's been a lot of movement around the Mediterranean. So think of the, the Roman Empire, for example. Uh, think of the spread of Islam. So there's been a lot of movement of people. And that's brought Neanderthal DNA from outside of Africa into Africa. There have been trading networks down the East African coast. So there's Neanderthal DNA, for example, over in Indonesia, about the same level as in Europeans. And so as people made trading networks around the Indian Ocean, and reached East Africa, they took Neanderthal DNA with them in their genomes if they then mix with the local population. So there is a there is a level of Neanderthal DNA in many Africans. Uh, it's certainly a lot smaller on average than it is in people outside of Africa. So the interbreeding we think happened outside of Africa, but yes, some amounts have come back into Africa afterwards. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, this is a question, uh, and I suppose in some ways this might be one of the suspicions that, that, that some people might have thought of when they first saw the news of this uh, discovery of a skull. Farah says, I was reading about Piltdown Man recently, fascinated by the story, and was just wondering about what are some of the other major fossil hoaxes. Chris, can you just tell, for people who might not know, the story of Piltdown Man? Yes, yeah, so uh, in uh, 1912, uh, allegedly, um, remains were found in a, in a gravel pit in Piltdown in, in uh, East Sussex. And these were interpreted as being parts of a, a single kind of ape man skull, as it was called at the time. So the jawbone looked very ape-like. The broken parts of a skull that were found with it looked much more like a, a modern human skull. And they were uh, stained dark like the gravels. Um, and there were stone tools there. Or there were animal remains there suggesting that in modern terms, these remains could have been a, a million years old. So this was published by um, British scientists as, as a new kind of human, uh, Eoanthropus dawsoni, the dawn man of Dawson. So Dawson was the guy who found most of the bits. Charles Dawson, a, uh, an amateur archaeologist, uh, actually a solicitor by trade. So whether that means you should trust him is, a, is another matter. But uh, anyway, um, he found most of the remains. And uh, up until the time he died, which was 1916, these remains were still accepted by most of the establishment as a true ancient human, showing that even Britain had an important story to tell in human evolution terms. But of course, the, even at the time, there were some people who thought this mixture of ape-like and human characteristics in a single fossil was very strange and had nature played a cruel trick by fossilizing a, a human skull there and the skull of an ape, uh, the jawbone of an ape in the same gravel pit. Uh, because there were fossil apes living in Europe, so some people speculated the jawbone could be a genuine ape's jawbone that somehow by bad luck has been mixed in the gravels with a human fossil. And they were closer to the truth because in 1953 it was finally shown that this was a, an entire fake, that the jawbone was actually an orangutan jawbone, and we've actually analysed the DNA now to show that it was an orangutan jawbone. Someone had filed the teeth down to look uh, like they were more human, uh, and the skull had been broken up. It was a modern human skull, slightly thicker than average, but it had been broken up. All of this stuff had been stained dark brown to match the gravels, and they'd all been dropped in the, uh, in the pit along with the stone tools and even the animal fossils. So the whole thing was a series of plants of, of genuine finds in some cases and fakes in other cases. And sadly, it fooled a lot of people for a, for a long time. Um, and Charles Dawson is the leading suspect for who was behind it, because after he died in 1916, there were no further discoveries in the region. And um, 
yeah, it's a sad story for British science in particular. And it held up the acceptance of genuine fossils from Africa, which didn't look like Piltdown Man. And was there a case in there, Chris? Was there something that they should have done? Some, is there something someone should have checked but didn't? Or is it a case that they didn't have the technology to know any better at the time? Yes. Yeah, so when you look on the molar teeth on the what we now know is an orangutan jawbone, you can actually see file marks on those teeth from um, probably a metal file. So those that was there for people to notice in 1912. But you know, people miss miss something obvious like that. So yeah, they wanted to believe in it, and I think they dropped their critical guard. Some of these people, particularly the British scientists, unfortunately. Yeah, Rebecca have a favorite uh a favorite might be the wrong word but an archaeological uh hoax oh god um i don't know if i can say a favorite because they're all kind of annoying <laughs> yeah i put um, favorite in big yeah in vertical but the one that i suppose has the most fascination in terms of what it was intending to do to change the narrative or or to you know for, for nationalistic reasons or whatever it might have been um i i mean there's not that many that kind of you know had the impact that Piltdown did there, there actually aren't um that many but there are some really bad claims as in like appallingly unbelievable um like there is from the states there is um I don't even know what it's called but it's like a claim that somebody had found like a giant skeleton and that this is a Neanderthal and it somehow ties into creationist explanations of Neanderthals that they're just giants that are in the bible and really weird stuff but you know if you look at the photos if you have any kind of you know background in archaeology or osteology or anything you're just like what (laughs) how could anyone believe that but that's the whole point that you know fakes the motivation for creating fakes is really variable and for some people they want to convince everybody and the fakes are going to be you know good quality but in other cases they actually have a particular target audience and that audience may not have the ability to assess that um, and therefore it becomes widely believed and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess that would be my my the one that connects to Neanderthals that I've seen before. There's these weird giants <laughs> that supposedly have been dug up somewhere in America. <laughs> As, as a the generation that had the unexplained magazine and Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, you know, I love things like, you know, the abominable snowman footprint uh, and and the wonderful, the Bigfoot footage, which is, is I think, been reasonably now, uh, it's been worked out it was a man in a gorilla costume. I mean, it definitely had the inkling of being a man in a gorilla, but I think they've now found the evidence. And I think it, it, it actually, it, it, it's all down to the, the ultimate evidence is the fact that Bigfoot appears to have a, a glass eye due to the way the light is reflecting off oh, it. Well, there's, there's some really fascinating but it might you know still it could might turn out bigfoot well, did have glass eye technology so mm. everybody loves a, a mystery and but what is so cool about actual science is that we have the mysteries you know like harbin skull what on earth is going on with that what how does it fit into what we know and you know that's why it's you don't even need these fakes because the present day understanding of human origins is so full of bizarreness um and you know so many little mysterious threads that we are still a long way from unpicking although we have a vast amount that we know you know you don't even need to go off the deep end into sort of strangeness and um, because it's already here and what we're dealing with so if your beard growing robin was an attempt to pass yourself off as the next bigfoot she's basically telling you it's not worth the bother oh you <laughs> wait you wait now and trapped in isolation like many of the other my sasquatch friends uh you wait it's going to happen um chris we have a question from jane which it might be too early i suppose to to, to answer this but interesting nevertheless of, of how it might be answered jane wants to know uh, since it's accepted that homo sapien and neanderthals interbred is the assumption now that we also interbred with the dragon man species too or will this be a separate evolutionary arch yeah that really uh there, there are lots of questions within that question so obviously what we found from our analyses of, of the Harbin cranium is that this was part of a, a deep East Asian lineage. I'm sorry I'm using those geographical terms, but it, you know, we have to communicate somehow about this. Um, so there was a deep East Asian um, human lineage, which Harbin's part of, and some other Chinese fossils are in there. They look similar to each other in various ways in their, in their crania and their teeth and so on. So there is this East Asian lineage that goes back probably hundreds of thousands of years, separate from Neanderthals, separate from Homo sapiens, separate from us. And then 
you've also got this line of humans traced on ancient DNA mainly called the Denisovans, who are in East Asia. The most important finds, uh, the most you know, informative finds are from this cave in Siberia, in Russia, Siberia in Russia, uh, Denisova Cave. So there are a whole number of fragmentary fossils from there uh, and DNA even in the cave sediments that shows the Denisovans were living in that cave for hundreds of thousands of years. And interestingly, harking back to uh, Rebecca's point, Neanderthals were also living there um, on and off over a long period of time as well. So Denisovans and Neanderthals at times both occupy Denisova Cave. So this Denisova lineage is mainly based on DNA. And of course, the, the, the obvious thing is, well, we've got a deep Asian lineage based on the Harbin skull and ones like it. We've got a deep Asian lineage based on DNA from Denisova Cave. Aren't they one and the same thing? And it would certainly simplify things if they were one and the same thing. But the main problem is we don't have a complete fossil skull with a complete Denisovan genome. You know, we've got fragmentary fossils with Denisovan genomes and we've got a beautiful skull like Harbin, but no DNA. So my Chinese colleagues are considering doing DNA investigations on the Harbin cranium. But it is destructive. And so they're thinking about that very carefully. It's got to be done one stage at a time. But if it turns out that Harbin is a Denisovan, and I, you know, I think it probably is, because we know Denisovans have got great big molar teeth. That's one of the things we do know about them. And the Harbin fossil has only one tooth left in it, and it's a great big molar that looks like the ones from, from Denisova Cave. So if Harbin is a Denisovan, yes, it would simplify things. And then back to that question, we know Denisovans have interbred with modern humans because there's Denisovan DNA in parts of Asia and especially down in Southeast Asia in places like New Guinea and Australia, there's levels of, quite high levels of Denisovan DNA up to maybe three or four percent in modern human genomes there from ancient interbreeding that happened probably in Southeast Asia. So these Denisovans were not just up in Siberia, they were down in Southeast Asia maybe places like Sumatra and, and, and Borneo and so on. And as modern humans pass through that region, going towards Australia and New Guinea, they interbred with Denisovans maybe 50,000 years ago. And so modern populations down there have Denisovan-like DNA. So Harbin, if Harbin is a Denisovan, then yes, its DNA probably does live on in modern humans today. Those that show Denisovan DNA in their genomes, they are related then to Harbin if Harbin is a Denisovan. But we mustn't get ahead of ourselves. We don't know for sure about that. For me, it's a probability, but we do need DNA from that Chinese group to really pin that down. And just give us an idea, just give us an idea of how destructive, you mentioned the word destructive, which sounds terrible. So you're not talking about grinding up the whole skull. But in order to get enough DNA to do anything useful, how much do you have to scrape off? Is it just like a tiny little scrape that you wouldn't notice to the eye? Or do you have to actually drill a hole in it to get enough to actually do some science with? One of the favoured areas for DNA extraction for Neanderthals, for example, is, is the inner ear bone. So that area uh, is has very good DNA preservation where it is preserved. It's very well preserved in the inner ear bones. But those inner ear bones are also anatomically very informative. So the inner ear bones of Neanderthals are a slightly different shape from our own. Um, so unfortunately, it would have to be done very carefully to minimise the damage to the inner ear bones. Um, you can attempt DNA just from bone fragments, but again, it will have to come from some part of the skull. There's also an alternative DNA extraction method from, from teeth, uh, from the cementum of teeth. But again, we will probably have to take that single molar tooth out of the skull to do that method. So all of these are destructive at one way or another. There's also a separate level of sort of type of investigation called um, proteomics where you look at fo fossil proteins so dna doesn't always survive well but um, proteins can survive better and so there's a possibility there are fossil proteins in the harbin fossil again that is destructive but you can you can actually assay for that beforehand so you can put a little like a laser scanner almost uh, over the fossil and that will tell you what the chances are that it's got collagen preserved and therefore that it's probably got fossil proteins preserved so that should be attempted on Harbin. That will then give us a clue whether there is anything there. I mean, it was probably in river sediments for 150,000 years. And it was also down a well 
in China for about 85 years. We haven't got onto that bit of the story yet. Yeah. This gold was actually <laughs> discovered. We, we come on to that one and maybe someone has asked about that. But yes, we don't know whether there is going to be any, any DNA or even any fossil proteins. More likely there's fossil proteins preserved and, and hopefully my Chinese colleagues can progress that and we can start to get some answers pointing to whether this fossil, this wonderful fossil is in fact a Denisovan. Well, you'd be glad to know, Chris, that we've literally just had a question in from Leon, which is exactly the next question. So, Rebecca, uh, the BBC story about Dragon Man said the skull was uncovered in 1933. Why is it taking this long to come to the conclusion it may be a new species uh, or super interesting at the very least? Uh, well, well, yes, <clears throat> it was the history of this. I mean, there's so many sort of things like this with other skulls where in human origins where they have very strange little backstories as to how we actually found or about them and this isn't the only one that was kind of found and then lost and stuff so what happened with this is that in 1933 China was um, occupied by Japan um, and the grandfather of the people who handed this skull over only in 2018 to researchers in China um, their grandfather um, was undertaking forced um, labour uh, building a bridge near the city of Harbin which is in um, northeast China and Apparently, um, I mean, this is I've I've looked at the paper. I've looked at the supplementary online materials in the paper, which is usually where you find out all the stuff about the history of how they found things. Um, and all it says in there is that this guy found it. Um, he potentially might have understood it was um, a human uh, potential, you know, human ancestral fossil because the Peking man finds um, were happening just before this. Um, so uh, this is um, a site uh, called Chukudian in China, um, very, very famous, a massive fossil site, huge news at the time. So that may have been part of what stoked his interest. But whatever happened, he recognised it was important and apparently hid it while he was um, you know, working and then put it in a well which, according to the paper, is, is a thing that you do in China if you find something precious and, and treasure-ish. Um, so thank goodness he did. Um, but then apparently told nobody until he was very near death. And then it was his um, grandchildren, I understand, that only found out in 2018. And immediately, you know, that was then handed over to um, researchers. So this skull, as far as I'm aware, was literally just down a disused well for all that time um i mean you know i'm thinking well what about the taphonomy you know what happened to the skull what you know what condition was it in but if it came from river gravels then that condition is not actually that different to what it had been in for tens of millennia anyway um so you know it's it's quite interesting as to whether um there would be any impact or not on dna probably not um so yeah a really interesting story and it does it does match up with so many other you know I guess serendipitous finds of fossils and um, quite often it's to do with infrastructure it's to do with building roads or railways or quarrying um that is one of the the main ways that things um have been found historically aside from actual targeted research missions where people go out and you know say i want to find something um so yeah it's it fits into that that broader pattern of how we find stuff and um, we're going to take a quick break from human remains for a question uh, for you, Helen. This is uh, from seven year old Layla uh, and uh, she would like to know, how do icebergs float? How do icebergs float? As, yeah, I feel this is well done, Layla, for um, letting everyone everyone process all the complicated human interactions before we get back to them. Uh, so the reason that icebergs float is that water is very strange stuff and one of the things that makes it very very unusual is that um, when it freezes, when it goes from being a liquid where the molecules can all move over each other to being a solid where they're all frozen in place, what happens is that as they freeze and they get locked into position they actually get a bit further apart. So um, that's really unusual because normally when you cool things down, they get closer and closer together. But in water, when it turns to ice, they just sort of puff themselves up a little, little bit. So the ice molecules are a little bit more spread out than the water molecules. And that means that ice is less dense than water. So what that means is that um, the same amount of ice takes up a lot more space, a bit more space. So when you put it in water, 
it's like something, uh, it's like a bath duck or something which has water, uh, air inside it that makes it a little bit fluffier. It's got a bit more space inside it, so it's less dense. And so it floats on top of the water underneath. Uh, it floats at the top. And so there's a little bit poking up above the surface, which is exactly how much extra space is taken up. So when you look at a, an iceberg, if you see one of those pictures, which are usually a bit fake, but anyway, where there's all that stuff underneath and you see the little bit poking up on top, that little bit poking up on top, that's how much it got bigger by. And so it doesn't need that space underwater. So it, it pokes up above the surface. So the reason icebergs float is that their molecules are a little bit further apart. And so they take up less space. So that's why that's why you see them. Because otherwise, the, what, the, the, re the reason it's really interesting is because if, if water didn't have that quirk, our oceans would basically be frozen. You know, when they froze, they'd freeze from the bottom up. Um, and the world would look very different. You, we wouldn't have had ice ages because any ice that formed would immediately have sunk and it would have changed the dynamics of things quite a bit. So actually that that property of water that it floats when it freezes completely defines our planet because if it didn't happen like that, um, ocean circulation would have shut down basically in the, in the way we know it today. So yeah, it's it's really interesting. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now we've got uh, lots more questions coming in uh, about now. Because it, it, uh, obviously it's been called Dragon Man. I suppose the question I want to ask first of all is: Do we know uh, the sex of the uh, of of the person who that that was their skull? Chris, do we know that? Uh, no, no, not certainly. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, what we can say is that uh, you know, on average, in in males today, and in Neanderthals, and in earlier humans. Males tend to be larger than females, but of course there's an overlap. Um, but this is a very, very large fossil. I mentioned it's, you know, it's certainly the biggest one I've ever, I've ever studied. It's got huge brow ridges. It's got very large mastoid processes. Uh, it, it's got a very large molar tooth. So those things tend to be bigger in males. So it is a guess. If we ever have the DNA, if we ever have proteins, we can maybe get a fix on whether it's male or female. But it's almost certainly, I would say, male based on the large size, but we can't be sure. So, yes, occasionally I've tried to say to journalists, well, we ought to call it dragon person. And they, you know, they just laugh and that gets forgotten. So I gave up trying to say, you know, we're not sure about the sex. I gave that up after about the, I don't know, maybe the 10th interview. So, um, you know, dragon man, it, it's, a, it's a nice name. Obviously, the, the media have run with that name. Um, we need popular names. We we could have given it a, a male name. Um, obviously, Lucy was given a female name because, again, assumed to be female, but but not definitely known. So um, we guess it's a male. And so that's why dragon man. Uh, we can say dragon human, of course. Um, my Chinese colleagues have given it a different species name, Homo longi, which is where the dragon man comes from. Longi uh, dragon in Chinese, because this province where Harbin is, is is known as the Dragon River province. So, and also there's an extra story called Professor G, the guy who, uh, you know, has the, the fossil in his university and led the whole project. Um, he mainly studies dinosaurs and in, in China, they're also called dragons, you know, ancient dragons. So again, he's known as the Dragon Man for his publications about dinosaurs. So now the dragon has a fossil called Dragon Man. So Peking uh, Man also also came from Dragon Bone Hill, didn't it? So there's, there's dragons right. everywhere. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. So um, we can't say for sh absolutely sure that it's male, but it but it you know very likely is a male individual. Um, and as for the species name, you know, I'm, you may have questions about that already and whether we should give a species name at all. So species names for me are labels to, uh, to help communication, because if they get in the way of communication, that can be an issue. So when I use species names like Neanderthals, I regard as a distinct species because morphologically, you know, in, in many ways, Neanderthals are as different in their morphology from us as, say, chimpanzees are from gorillas. So if we look at the middle and the inner ear bones of ne us and Neanderthals, ours and Neanderthals are actually more different in shape than those of gorillas and chimpanzees. So on that level, we can call Neanderthals a distinct species. And in that sense, Homo longi, uh, you know, I think that group are a distinct species. Personally, when I look at the fossils in China, there's a fossil from Dali in China, uh, which we've known about for many years. 
I think that Dali and Harbin are similar enough that they represent the same species. And that Dali fossil was given many years ago, which some people use, Homo daliensis. So my personal preference is to say that the Harbin cranium, if it is a distinct species, the valid name for it should be Homo daliensis. So I didn't uh, join my Chinese colleagues in naming it as, as Homo lungi. Uh, but I'm happy to keep using Dragon Man as the popular name. So we should just perhaps be clear here that when you be clear here that when you say the Harbin skull and Dragon Man, those are the same thing. Yes, or, yes. So yes. Dragon Man is the popular name uh, in the media for the Harbin cranium, but the group itself, if it has a different species name, I would say Homo daliensis. And of course, when I use species in this sense for us or Neanderthals, I'm not implying that they didn't interbreed with each other. We know. There was interbreeding between us and Neanderthals in the past, between Denisovans and, and us and Neanderthals in the past. So many closely related mammal species and bird species do interbreed a bit. But as long as, it, as long as they don't merge into a single species, as long as they keep their separate identity through time, uh, then I think you know, they're, they're different lineages. And I think we and Neanderthals were different lineages. And the Harbin cranium represents a separate lineage in East Asia. And I think it actually helps us understand human evolution a bit better because there have been many different interpretations of these Chinese fossils. Some people see them as straightforward intermediates between an earlier species, Homo erectus. So we've heard about Peking man. So many Chinese workers have argued that the Peking man populations from about half a million years ago are the direct ancestors of Homo sapiens, our own species, and that the fossils in China just form a nice orderly line of progression through from Peking man to modern humans. But I would say the Harbin group shows that that isn't true. What you've got is a separate group comparable with the Neanderthals, comparable with Homo sapiens that evolved in Asia over many hundreds of thousands of years, probably went extinct 40 or 50,000 years ago, around the same time that the Neanderthals went extinct. But we don't know that for sure yet. And a quick question. Quick, quick uh, follow-up question. Claudia just wants to know, how tall was Dragon Man? Do we know? Yeah, no part of the skeleton, unfortunately. Um, I mean, if, if uh, we look at the other Chinese remains, there is a, a, a partial skeleton from Jinu Shan in China, which we think is in the same group as Harbin. That has got a skeleton. It's a female individual. And yeah, I can't remember the high estimates, but I believe she was a, a, maybe around five foot six. So very strongly built, very wide, short and wide body uh, from what I remember of the Jinu Shan publications. If we ever find the skeleton that goes with Harbin Man, we assume it will be very large, but actually he may not have been that tall because the, the climate in Harbin, even today, has extremely cold winters. So, um, you know, in those kind of conditions, humans tend to be shorter and wider. So the Neanderthals have a relatively short and wide body. I reckon the Harbin people probably even more so. So living up there, you have winter temperatures today can be minus 16 centigrade. So very cold winters. They have an ice festival every year in Harbin um, to celebrate the, uh, the, the very cold winters. So these people were adapting incredibly. 150,000 years ago or more, these people were adapting to extreme cold in the winters. So I reckon they had a, a short, wide body, probably subcutaneous fat. Who knows? Maybe they had more body hair. We don't know that. Um, and maybe I'm pretty sure they had cultural adaptations. They, they must have had clothing, shelters, probably the use of fire to help them adapt. But, now, that's interesting, yeah. Rebecca, that, Rebecca, that talking about cultural uh, adaptations and culture as a whole. This is a question from Ellie, um, and she says, uh, presumably this is difficult to know for certain, but what and when is the first known example of uh, some form of human making music? Now, Rebecca, I presume it, this is the, one of the great challenges in archaeology of being able to find, you know, forms of, 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 of culture that are left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult because... Um, Two reasons. One is um, that quite often musical instruments as we perceive them today um, are traditional musical instruments are made of organic stuff that's going to rot. You know, OK, we have like the brass section in classical orchestras and stuff, but actually a lot of traditional instruments, um, whether you're talking like a lute or pipes, you know, they're made of um, bones or wood, things like this, um, animal guts for the strings. So 
you have to be lucky to find um you know and what at what point music shifts into like an aesthetic our all experience you know uh, what what is an instrument basically is, is what i'm saying um so with those things in mind the oldest actual things that we are certain are an instrument um are only about i think no older than 40,000 um sort of late 30,000s um and those are basically well they call we call them flutes but they're not really flutes um they are the bones quite often of birds um with finger holes and when you play a flute you play it sideways and you blow across a hole whereas we think maybe these were played more like a pipe with a little thing in the end of the bone functioning like a reed in a clarinet or something like that or an oboe and the reed sort of vibrates and passes the air through so we might be missing a bit but you can also get some sound out of them if you blow across the end of the hole. So we don't know how they're actually played. Um, so they are definitely associated with um, some of the earlier Homo sapiens populations, and those are from Europe. Um, there's also, um, I think, a later, I think it might be Magdalenian, so that's sort of about 17,000 um, years ago, where there is a shell, um, a big shell, conch shell, I think, um, where there was a again they've they've done something to the end of the shell and put a little um uh a mouthpiece on it and that would have been blown but again that's that's even later so you know the origins of music is the really interesting thing and that's what we don't know there has been a claim for neanderthals of a um a bone uh that was supposed to be like a flute um from a cave um I think in Slovenia um but the problem with that is that you have to be really sure when you find a long hollow bone with holes in it that those were actually made by an individual human because it turns out hyenas are very good and other animals at just nibbling stuff and their teeth can pierce um and they can look very much like um holes because you know the teeth are evenly spaced <laughs> um so I think for that particular find um I, I don't think it's widely accepted. Chris has got a, something he wants to say on that. Yeah, I think it's also worth remembering that, of course, uh, singing could have been part of the, the story as well, uh, singing and chanting. Um, and also it's been suggested, I think, and, you know, more about this, Rebecca, probably, is that even in caves, the acoustics of caves uh, may have been partly influenced by the, uh, you know, the sound systems where they give yeah. things. Sound may have been important for singing or chanting. And even stalagmites, it's been suggested that they also could have been played. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and what we were saying earlier about the importance of the inner of the the ear bones, and and about you know that Neanderthals are a bit different to us. There's been some really cool recent work that's backed up basically all the accumulation of knowledge that we have had to this point, which suggests that vocal communication of some point of some some kind rather was really important to Neanderthals and also to our common ancestor with Neanderthals probably, that some kind of vocalisation was part of everyday life. And as Chris says, singing may be part of that. But I also want to make the point, um, as I sort of said, that even objects that we're not thinking about as potentially musical, like stalagmites, could be part of this. And there is um, a very famous um, find uh, from um, a cave called Krapina, a Neanderthal cave, um, probably about the same age as Harbin, potentially, <laughs> actually, um, maybe about 130,000 years, something around that time, um, of uh, about eight talons of um, uh, white-tailed eagles. And these have been shown to have, first of all, they've got pigment on at least one of them. There's a pigment mix. This is very interesting in itself. That's a whole other conversation about visual aesthetics. But those um, talons, some of them have little polish marks as if they've been rubbing up against each other or something else of a similar hardness that would cause polish. And so the team that worked on that proposed, well, perhaps it's a necklace. That implies visual display you know, about personhood and stuff, but there's no reason why those could not have been strung together and been a rattle 
you know, it could be either. There's no reason to choose one over the other. So I think that's something that's important to remember that even very everyday stuff or eat, you know, stalagmites or the sound of flint napping or hitting wood, because, you know, Neanderthals were working wood a lot. Um, all these things could have been combined into the development of um, an aural aesthetic tradition. And also, um, if you want to go right back, um, we share, uh, you know, chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, although our common ancestor with them is seven odd million years ago. But we can see in chimpanzees, um, they some groups have a tradition of what's called buttress drumming, where in the forest, really huge trees, massive sort of um, buttress roots that come down. And um, if you bang on them or they stamp on them, um, the chimps, they create huge booming sounds. And that may be being used actually for long term, uh, long distance communication between different chimpanzees while they're out and about um, within their own group or potentially even to signal presence to other groups. But the point is, it's the creation of noise. Um, so this uh, this capacity in the hominin group could go back very, very deep. Wonderful. Uh, we've got uh, we're not going to get through all the questions, Helen, in a minute there's a jam question that's come up which i think is merely a moment of synchronicity or coincidence uh but terry uh who's age nine would like to know could humans evolve into something else could we have two different sorts of humans again uh chris do you want to start on this and just to tell you we've only got yes. five minutes left yes okay yeah tricky one of course because uh, you know I, I get this kind of question quite often um i mean evolution doesn't have a forward look it's what works now so you can't really look forward and predict what's going to happen um yes if humans diversify in the future so for example on some of the worst predictions of uh, global warming uh, we could have human populations crowded up near the north pole and down near the south pole with no one living in between because it's just too hot and too uninhabitable so might that influence you know the evolution of two separate human populations in the long term so i think there you've got to guess how humans are going to cope with climate change, how much communication there would be between different groups, and of course, how long the global warming phase will run before the, the big cycle of climate change takes us back towards an ice age, for example. So there's all those uncertainties. But yes, evolution is working in us. We've all got mutations compared with our parents. So evolution does go on. And yes, in the future, there might be even uh, separations of human populations. And if humans actually got to other planets and founded colonies there, maybe that would drive eventually enough separation to have speciation in the long term. Uh, and this question about hair from Wormcar6. Hair has always bothered me. Every other animal on Earth looks fab without tending our hair. We look a mess. Did they have shorter hair or combs to cope in the past? Now, of course, that's not to be fair. There's a lot of other animals as well that look quite unruly, but I presume it's very often because we manicure and uh, and and all manner of other breeding things. So, Rebecca, you know, how do we deal with our hair? Um, oh, difficult question. Um, whenever anyone asks about hair, I always think about that photo of a chimpanzee who lost all of its hair and it just looks utterly weird. I <laughs> don't know if anyone's seen that on the internet, but um, we don't know. Um, I think the earliest combs in the archaeological record, I don't think we have any from the Paleolithic or potentially even the Mesolithic. So I don't think we've got anything like that pre 10,000 years ago. It's all from sort of uh, Neolithic populations. That's what I believe. Um, basically, it, but if you look at the variety of what um, humans today do, including the uh, living and recent hunting and gathering populations, um, people are very creative with their hair. Um, it's, you know, it's not just something that sits on your head. Um, it's managed for, um, health and hygiene reasons but it also is part of personal display and identity so I think as with everything with Neanderthals we should imagine that there was diversity and variety and the same with other hominin groups that you know maybe that's one of the things that that Neanderthals might have thought when they met the Harbin population they'd be like oh my god look at what <laughs> what do they look like you know with, with the hair who knows um I think yeah probably variety <laughs> 
Now, this is, uh, we won't answer this question, but Manny asked a question, uh, thoughts on the German study that suggested possessing particularly Neanderthal genes increased the chance of a more severe form of COVID, which I think we talked about on genetic shambles in the past. So, Manny, if you want to go back, but that obviously was a few months ago. I wonder from 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 either uh, you, Rebecca, or Chris, where would be a good place for Manny to find out uh, some, some, some decent evidence-based uh, um, studies on this? On the COVID question, well, yeah, obviously there's a lot on Twitter about Neanderthal. Um, I mean, obviously there are some Neanderthal variants that supposedly make COVID better and some that make it worse. Um, and in the Indian subcontinent, there's a claim that there the COVID variants uh, are related to Neanderthal breeding. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot on Twitter. If, you, if they were to search on Twitter, Neanderthal COVID, they should find some connections there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have time to work. There's an out of Africa question about why humans evolved uh, in, in Africa. I, I reckon, Dance Jane, I apologise. I think that's going to be too long a question for us to deal with today. Uh, though, again, we have, I think, dealt with it on some of the, if you, if you look back on some of the genetic shambles that we did uh, back in the autumn with uh, Chris and Rebecca, I think we did cover some of those. So so we, the, there are some answers out there. We've had a few more questions. We had a lot more questions come in, of course. Uh, um, do we know what Neanderthal singing voices might have been like uh rebecca <laughs> well we know what a bbc documentary claimed that they were like <laughs> um yeah there is a absolute hysterical video um from this documentary which is quite old now i don't i can't remember when that was made um which claimed that they basically had a very odd high nasal almost screaming kind of voice and I don't think any recent work has been done in terms of modelling the sound of their voice. But, um, I mean, they had large, large, very large lungs, chest, perhaps there was more resonance. You know, I think Chris can talk to the anatomy, but certainly the, the more recent research on the ear anatomy um, implies that they were able to um, perceive uh, sort of soft consonant sounds and um, like all that kind of thing. So that has implications for the sort of potential speech they had. But how they actually sounded, I don't know of any more recent work. Chris can probably <laughs> apply in on that. Yeah, the vocal tract may have been a little bit less deep than ours, so that would go with having a slightly higher pitch to the voice. But given those powerful lungs, I reckon they could have whistled very strongly. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. So to this wonderful kind of because Roger Whittaker did have a big beard as well, didn't he? So I suppose that <laughs> uh, for those of you who remember Roger Whittaker, I'm going to leave old Durham town anyway. So uh, thank you very much both to uh, Chris and Rebecca. Helen, we're going to come in with the jam question. But uh, just in case Chris and Rebecca needed to get off and do other things, this is uh, I mean, unless you, you are very welcome just to, to, for your input on uh, the nature of jam, uh, which is going to come up. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, everyone who supports us of our Patreon. If you can support us of our Patreon, patreon.com slash cosmic shambles we're currently making uh, tips for existence obviously this every single week and uh, we also do book shambles uh, brain yapping with rachel england and dean burnett and uh, also series of wife on earth with joanna neary and if you go to the cosmic shambles site you will see lots of uh, other stuff as well uh, out there that, that that gets made including uh, various short films and uh, documentary pieces so if you can support us we'll have a new series of uncanny hour soon as well which i think we're going to start with alan garner's um owl service our service with Stuart lee um amongst others so thank you those of you who support us and uh, if you can support us it would be fantastic uh because uh, yeah more touring's being cancelled for the autumn as well hooray though helen and me will hopefully be at stand and calling uh the saturday after next i think at uh, a midday so if you're going to the stand and calling festival hopefully we will be there um so this is the jam question uh this comes from chris uh he says please bear with me for this long and potentially ridiculous question that you're welcome to ignore well we haven't. It came out of a slightly drunken conversation with my flatmate recently. Are states of matter of a compound sus substance always reversible? For example, if you have an ice block and boil it, you can easily collect the vapour and turn it back to ice. But say you boiled a pot of jam in an enclosed system. Could you turn all that jam into jam vapour and simply lower the temperature enough within that system and get more or less the same jam back at the end? Or is there too much destruction in the boiling? Helen? Helen? 
I love the idea of a phase diagram for jam. And what a phase diagram is, just to, just to set the context here, is quite often the, the state of matter changes when you change the temperature, but it also changes when you change the pressure. And uh, so you can draw those, and you draw a map of if you increase the temperature but decrease the pressure, what are things in? So I love the idea of a phase diagram for jam. Um, the short answer is that the problem with organic stuff um, is that it tends to break apart when it gets too hot uh, and especially when it evaporates eventually it will burn um, so jam in practice will probably in order to it would it would boil for quite a long time and once it had lost all its um, vapor it would start to burn and then you'd have jam on fire and it's very difficult to turn burnt jam back into unburnt yeah. jam so but it's a really interesting question so basically you it doesn't work even for substances that don't burn and it doesn't work in both directions. So, for example, when you have rubber, um, you vulcanize it. So you add sulfur to add cross links between the molecules. Um, and the problem is that once they're there, you can't take them out again. So you form rubber from a liquid. But once it's set, once those cross links are made, you can't send it back the other way because it's all it's all locked up on the inside. So there are actually quite a lot of things which you can make into a solid, but it's very hard to make them back into the same liquid. Um, and there are plastics like that as well. The difference between a thermosetting plastic uh, and a thermoplastic that 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 is the ones you can melt and solidify and the ones that will just go in one direction. Um, so with jam, I, I think it is not possible to vaporize jam. Although it's a really lovely thought. I mean, obviously, there's, you get the aromatics in the air. As When I was making jam the other day, you can definitely smell someone was making jam. Raspberry jam smells amazing when you're boiling it. Um, but those are just aromatic mo organic molecules. And most of it, which is sugar, uh, will caramelize and then burn before it becomes a gas. And once it's caramelized and burnt, it's then carbon dioxide. And in order to get that back into raspberry jam, you've got to grow another raspberry. Um, so perhaps you can do it the very long way around. You can do it by in a little biodome using the car the emitted carbon dioxide to grow more raspberries and then you could have liquid jam again. But otherwise, the answer is no, that it is true that there are lots of things that you cannot vaporize and then turn back into a liquid, although it's a lovely idea. And I can imagine that being a very long, drunken conversation. Hopefully uh, you'll see on Cosmic Shambles soon a four part series called The Cycle of Jam, which uh, Helen will be presenting from the Eden Project. We'll hopefully get Brian Cox on because we'll talk about the death of the strawberry again, which we haven't talked about for a while. Um, but uh, thank you all for joining in. And do be very careful with jam, by the way. I'm just going to say because they never made a public information yeah, film about you it. You can see this. I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got my You've jam got a jam burn. burn. You've got a jam uh, burn. That was yeah. That when I was growing up, that was the the great warning. Whenever my mum was making jam, there was a child once who put a spoon of jam. He didn't know how it, all of the skin of their mouth came off. You know, it was we're the, still waiting to find that fossil in the Neanderthals. <laughs> well, we we Neanderthal jam technology is another thing that we'll we'll deal with perhaps in the uh, in the four part series of the cycle of jam. Hopefully, we'll see you next week or during the week. Uh, lots more shows coming up. As I said, next week we're going to be talking with uh, Alam Shah, who writes wonderful books and a, a great science teacher. Uh, and we'll be talking about science education. So if you have any questions, uh, children question, adult questions, we will try and make this a family friendly show. But in particular, if, if uh, anyone who's at school and says, why aren't we being taught this? And why don't we, you know, these are the times where we can really play around and talk about what people wish they were taught uh, about science. For some of us, it might be too late. And uh, for, for many, it might be a chance to try and change the curriculum. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, we will see you soon. Bye bye.